I'd like to call to order the San Carlos City Council meeting for May 23rd, 2016. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Are there any changes to the order of the agenda? None from staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do we have a report from closed session? No reportable item from closed session, Mr. Mayor. Okay, then we'll move on to item five, council communications and announcements, and we will start with Matt. Okay. Um, well, I didn't have any meetings I attended, but I did. I went through the parade route twice because I went through as myself the first time and then as Ron Collins the second time. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Much appreciated. All right. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, I, too, enjoyed uh, going through not only the Hometown Days Parade, but Hometown Days itself, which is in some ways a lot more fun. Um, and yes, Matt and I tried to do a very good job of, of letting people know that Ron would have been there. You were there in spirit. So, um, I also just want to say that uh, since it's been roughly a year since uh, uh, both Matt and I were out of a meeting for various uh, medical issues, uh, it's good that we're all back here. Here, here. Uh, Ron? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really only have one official thing. Uh, uh, we On the 11th, we had a, a donor appreciation event over at Devil's Canyon for the uh, uh, for the uh, heart of the housing endowment and, and uh, regional trust, and I want to thank I think Mark and Cameron and Bob are all there, I so there. you were not there. I, well, there were a lot of people, so anyway, thanks to Mark and uh, and Bob uh, for coming. Uh, it was a it was a great event. We we raised a fair amount of money, even though it was an appreciation event. We didn't ask for any, but we did raise them. Um, other than that, I was out most of the last week because uh, so I had to uh, cancel my participation in uh, council related activities. But, I, you know, it's funny when you're on the council, you, you don't think you're going to observe things that, that uh, happen in life. And last week we were out of town and we were in Arizona. And we went to this little town, this remote uh, uh, former copper mining uh, town called Bisbee, Arizona. It's, I don't know, 40 or 50 miles north of the Mexican border. And I was walking along and I, I looked down and I noticed that Bisbee has a sewer system. Uh, and uh, it's something I not, would not have... Uh, ordinarily notice, and this is a very remote town. Um, I have no report on the rate structure, though. Um, <laughs> uh, we also visited uh, uh, Tombstone and the Oak, uh, Tombstone, Arizona, and the OK Corral, and it's a reminder of how far we've come in, uh, in, when it comes to public safety. Um, turns out that uh, Big Nose Kate uh, was the only eyewitness to the gunfight that was never called to testify. So... Anyway, um, things were different 100, uh, 134 years ago. So, and anyway, that's all I have. All right, thanks, Ron. Bob? Well, I, I got the coolest car in the, in, the, in the parade, I thought, so. I beg to differ. <laughs> pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> pretty loud, too. Yeah, it was loud. Well, it, it fit the, I think it fit the person that was riding in it, so. But uh, that's another story. Um, I, I, uh, we had a meeting of um, the uh, SBWMA where we're looking for an executive director. We're going to have another meeting on Thursday, and we're hopefully getting close to uh, uh, getting an executive director, hopefully in the next two to three weeks, I hope, for that position. Um, and we have a meeting uh, next week, I think, on Silicon Valley Clean Water. And other than that, I don't really have much to say. All right. Thanks, Bob. Um, as for me, um, I've had a really fun time the last two weeks being mayor, um, and I brought some pictures. So um, two weeks ago, we had a... Um, don't, or a volunteer appreciation event um, for Healthy Cities Tutoring in this room. It was totally packed. Every seat was taken. There were people lined up against the wall. Um, this year there were close to 400 um, volunteers in San Carlos who, who uh, uh, volunteered by tutoring in um, San Carlos classrooms. We handed out awards of appreciation. Um, there was one gentleman who started um, 
started tutoring at age 78, and he was getting his 15-year uh, commendation. For uh, He's now 93 years old. Um, there was a gentleman who tutored a, a, a child for uh, eight years. He gave a, a speech. Um, then the kid came up and gave a speech. I mean, there, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. So I really um, appreciate the work that Healthy Cities Tutoring does for our community, both for the volunteers and for the students, and it was a really lovely event. Um, speaking of sewer rates, um, so I took the opportunity, since we were um, talking about sewer, uh, the sewer system, to actually go take a, a tour of the sewer plant, which I had never been. I went with um, one of our residents, Lorene Letterer, who had raised some concerns um, about the sewer rate structure. We had a, a great two-hour tour. Um, I encourage um, other folks to go. Um, there's a, a lot of work to be done to upgrade our sewer system, but um, you know we have a great plant out there at the end of... Uh, at the end of Redwood Shores uh, that's obviously very necessary. Um, so I was very impressed by the executive director and all the work um, that they're doing out there at the plant. Um, I had the opportunity to attend the Kiwanis um, uh, auction and uh, uh, volunteer event. Um, it was a great sort of showcase of our new adult community center. It was a really beautiful event. Mark was there as well and had the opportunity to talk to um, uh, members of the Kiwanis Club and all, about all the great work that they're doing. I also was in the parade. I had a pretty cool car, maybe not as cool as yours, but um, my daughter uh, had been in the parade with me the last two years, but my son was now finally old enough to go in the parade, so he had a great time. Um, I also had an opportunity to judge the pet parade, and here I'm with uh, Irene Chen from the school board and Lydia Rack, uh, who won the theme contest this year, and uh, this was the winner of Best in Show, Ginger the dog. <laughs> It was a beautiful dog. Um, and then uh, the, I also had a chance to kick off the um, kick off hometown days with uh, the, uh, the um, kids' concert on Friday evening, um, which was sponsored by SCEF. Um, and as many of you know, uh, I've t taken the opportunity each month um, this year to donate my um, mayor's salary to a different organization in town. And, and this month, um, I'm, I'm donating it to SCEF. I think everybody knows all the great work that um, the San Carlos Education Foundation does to support our schools, um, raising over $2 million a year to support um, general instruction and things like music and art, um, and I think they're, they're a huge asset to our city. Um, on Sunday, I had the opportunity to be a judge for the um, Hack San Mateo County event, which was a all-day-long event where um, young software developers were presented with um, policy issues facing the county that technology could solve, and they were given access to um, city or county data. And they sat in teams and they built apps and, um, and competed for prizes. This was one of the five um, uh, grand prize winning teams. They built an app that um, allows um, young people in San Mateo County to be able to search for jobs and internship opportunities in the county as well as get job tips and um, learn how to write a resume and things like that. But there was another team that created an app that um, allowed foster kids to check in uh, so that they, so, which could reduce um, case wor uh, caseworker load because foster kids could self-report on how they're doing. There were a lot of really um, cool um, uh, applications and um, uh, things that people built, and, and I was really excited to be a part of it. Um, lastly, this morning um, I attended a board meeting for the San Mateo County Libraries. Um, today we looked at the budget. I just wanted to show this briefly to my colleagues. Um, you know, we've been talking about performance measures for um, budgeting. This is how the library presents their for, their performance measures. Um, they're they're doing a, an excellent job. Um, and uh, the, the library is in great um, financial health. So the, the blue line here is projected revenues and the orange line is um, projected expenditures. So the library continues to run a surplus and it's um, able to invest a lot back into the actual facilities and programs. This year we're doing a lot with technology. Lastly, um, one of the things that we've been doing this year on the library board is um, rebranding the libraries, um, and this was a, a very short video that I just wanted to show everyone. I think they did a really excellent job. This was came out earlier this month, and it sort of showcases the new branding of the San Mateo County Library System. So, if, Crystal, if you wouldn't mind playing that. And there's great music, which I don't know if we can hear, but you'll get a sense.
Maybe I'll just do a little voiceover. So there's tw there's 12 libraries in in the system. Um, we really wanted to focus the um, the branding to. It used to be called San Mateo County Library, which was kind of confusing. So we've changed it to libraries. There's now just a real focus on the whole, all of kind of the learning that the library system offers um, beyond just the traditional um, book catalog, uh, including technology and um, their. Um, really focused on just um, growing all those programs, growing um, uh, adult literacy, growing um, programs for kids, growing technology, and um, they have a new tagline in which I think is very appropriate, uh, and it's gonna come up here in a second, which is called um, Open for Exploration. So I think they did a very nice job uh, with their new branding. Um, and I believe that's my last slide. Yes, okay, so that's, that's what I've been up to. All right, so we'll move on to item 5B, um, staff comments. Mr. Malpe. None this evening, Mr. Mayor. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to item six. Uh, tonight we have a presentation on an affordable housing initiative called No Voucher Left Behind from um, Congresswoman Jackie Spears' office, Mr. Brian Perkins. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for having us this evening. Mr. Mayor, through the chair. I would also like to just uh, briefly recognize that uh, today is uh, Mr. Perkins' 60th birthday, so I thought we might wish him happy, happy birthday. birthday. Yeah. <laughs> we have no voucher left behind, and the other slogan is still standing after all this time, right? Did you bring us cake? Do we have cake? I've had so much cake that I'm going to have to go to Kaiser Emergency again. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, on February 26th, uh, and I'm the district director for Congresswoman Jackie Spear, my apologies. On February 22nd, uh, Congresswoman Spear held a uh, countywide uh, meeting on running uh, rental housing here in San Mateo County. We had about um, 250 attendees, and about half of them were landlords and about half of them were renters. And as the council members all know, you can anticipate what the comments were during that um, session. Um, after that, about a week after that, we convened a smaller meeting with the landlords and the county housing department trying to find things that could be done almost immediately in order to try to deal with our cost of housing initiative because the long term, obviously, you need to build more affordable housing. That's, that's pretty obvious. But in the short term, as it turns out, the federal government actually funds uh, 4,400 vouchers in San Mateo County. These are called moving to work vouchers, and these are for low-income families, and those vouchers are there to make it it possible for these low-income families to live amongst us and to pay market rents without themselves uh, having to bear the full cost. So they would typically have their uh, contribution toward their own rent capped at about one-third of their gross income per month. As it turns out, um, of the 4,400 vouchers that are authorized for San Mateo County and fully funded, about 4,000 are used, leaving about 400 that aren't used. And there's a variety of reasons, but I think uh, as Mr. Cole from the County Housing Department will explain to you, Probably the chief reason is just market competition at this point. The market rate is very high. San Mateo County actually has a novel program. Uh, it's a moving to work program. It's a special program under federal law in which um, Mr. Cole and his team have a lot of flexibility as to how they can handle the vouchers. And in fact, what he's going to talk to you a little bit about is an incentive program that he's created for landlords so that they would have additional uh, financial reasons to accept these vouchers. But what we would like to do is to talk to the council about um, some sort of informal partnership with your staff to try to identify local landlords that might, in fact, be willing to accept more vouchers. There are about, at the moment, 1,900 landlords countywide, and a typical uh, situation would be a landlord accepting somewhere between one and five of these vouchers for their properties, and this could be any size of property. It just so happens that we have a lot of people with their toe in the water, but not a huge commitment, and that's all fine and well. Those people will be the first ones that are asked if they could please put another toe into the market and, and accept yet another voucher. Um, but the folks that are on this program are all part of the Moving to Work program, which is a five-year program. They have an income typically, and they are moving into a higher income level in order to become self-sufficient here in San Mateo County. So a uh, demographic profile would be um, a single parent with a couple of children and uh, the kind of job that you might expect that would be earning minimum wage or a little bit above minimum wage. And for those of you that have had the privilege of going to the HIP housing uh, annual moving to work uh, 
uh, uh, event, that's where you'll see a lot of these people who have gone through these programs that both HIP Housing and the county operate um, a self-sufficiency program. And they will tell these wonderful stories about how they went from being part-time or full-time but still below the poverty level here in San Mateo County and uh, nonetheless wind up holding jobs that are pretty significant in our community, including hospital administrators and so forth. So there is a real push for, by these folks to, um, to make themselves self-sufficient, to have their children live in stable environments. And yet, at the same time, it's a challenge because uh, they can't compete in the housing market that we have at the moment. At this point, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ken Cole. He's uh, the new head of our county housing department, and he was hoping that he could talk to you a little bit about his program and the incentives. And then our ask this evening is really that the council would authorize staff to work with us a little bit, see if we can get some uh, local landlords that the uh, staff themselves might be aware of, teach the staff about the program, and see if we could work cooperatively to make you know, get a dozen or so, two dozen of these vouchers perhaps used here in San Carlos. And we'll be making similar requests of other city councils around the county. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, as Brian said, I'm Ken Cole. I'm director of the Department of Housing for the County of San Mateo. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, Mr. Mayor, council members, Mr. Maltby. Uh, I am fairly new to the community myself. I came over from uh, Santa Cruz County where I ran the um, Homeless Services Center for about 10 years and then I ran their housing authority for about six years. And it's a pleasure to be in this community, but I'm afraid we have an affordability crisis that is quite um, quite amazing when you, when you sit and look at it on the ground. So a couple of things I want to add about the program to highlight what, what Brian very eloquently described is first of all, um, this is traditionally the Section 8 program, which is a, a, a euphemism that we many of us in the business would love to see uh, fade away. The official name of the program is the Housing Choice Voucher Program, and as Brian described, it's meant to be federal portable housing subsidy that helps a low-income family, a low-income um, disabled individual or um, a senior citizen compete in the marketplace, and it roughly pays, uh, the voucher subsidy pays about 70% of the cost uh, in the marketplace and the family or individual contributes roughly 30 percent. This program really works and the best evidence I can give you of that is from the landlord perspective we've got upwards of 1900 landlords actively participating in the market despite how fast our market is moving. And the challenge now is that when these units turn over uh, there are people waving their checkbooks at the landlord uh, with no red tape, no no government protocols involved. And as Brian said, we are moving work to work agency. We have less regulation than the typical housing authority, but we still have red, some red tape. My commitment as we go out to the communities is if you can steer me to a landlord, I will do everything I can in the program to make it work for that landlord. So uh, the program does work. We can make it work even better. We have to capture this subsidy before we lose it. And this is something that business people understand. When I explain that the federal subsidy that we're talking about for those 400 vouchers that are going unused is about a half million dollars a month based on an average subsidy per voucher of about $1,200 in the marketplace. And not only does that mean that there's 400 families that aren't housed literally on the program, it also means that in the next cycle of federal budget making, we could lose that total amount of dollars because they, what they do is they shrink the base. I'm sure you're familiar with this in other, in other revenue streams. So we have a great challenge before us. We can help people and we can hang on to precious uh, federal housing dollars. And I know this community can do it. And 400, four, the number 400 is an interesting one because I think it's really achievable even in this hot market. So a couple of quick things I'll mention that we're doing differently as we roll out this campaign. First of all, we're trying to hang on to those landlords that are helping us right now. So we have a landlord no loss, or excuse me, a landlord continuity bonus. So if a family moves out, and the landlord re-rents to another voucher holder will provide um, 
an incentive to that landlord for uh, continuing with the program. We have also uh, a landlord sign-up bonus, if you will, a $1,000 bonus if a landlord who has not participated in the program for three years comes back to the program and rents to a household with a voucher. And we also have a no loss bonus, and this is, gets a little into the weeds, but basically a lot of landlords uh, steer away from the program because they believe that they'll lose rent while the family gets processed for the voucher and the subsidy. And there is some time that gets lost in that exchange, but we will back that and make sure the landlord does not lose money if they jump into the program and rent to this um, this household. And the last thing I'd like to leave you with is the sense of civic, I don't want to say civic duty, but civic involvement. And the landlords in our community are great people. And a lot of them are small operators, a lot of them are families, um, have fam families that have been even passed on properties through the generations. And they want to stay um, active members in our community. And this is a way that they can really can really help our community and help uh, families that are doing everything they can to um, pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to answer any questions that you have. Uh, uh, absolutely. Um, I appreciate you bringing this to our attention. Any questions? Ron? Uh, yeah, thank, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, Brian and Kent, uh, thank you for the presentation and thanks for coming. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm on the San Mateo County Affordable Housing Task Force and it's, it's a monthly exercise in frustration um, to be reminded of this crisis every month. Um, I feel like we are making you know, a little bit of progress sort of inch by inch. But I guess my, my question is, um, what would you like us to do as a city? Well, how, can we, how can we really help move this along? Well, uh, first, the commitment of a little bit of staff time, because ultimately what's going to happen probably is someone's going to have to make an engagement with a landlord. And it can certainly be the county, but the county only has a certain amount of personnel as well. And if we don't get the problem resolved by the end of the year, there's a good chance that we'll not have the money. So it's going to be communities pulling together. And a little bit of staff time might mean sending out letters to landlords within the cities, encouraging them on the city letterhead to consider the program and giving Ken or someone else's phone number at the department, actually making some phone calls if you know people. As council members, you all know, landlords, we all do, and encouraging them to get involved, learning a little bit at staff level so that if someone has a housing opportunity available, they'll encourage them to use the voucher program or to at least consider it. Um, there's no, I, you know, we're, this is a special ask, and I recognize the staff is fully committed across the days. I get that. But at the same time, it's not a lot of ask. It's more about doing the things that, that staff does traditionally, which is to network and use their own existing resources in a very creative way to try to to, to, to introduce people to something they may not be familiar with, frankly, or haven't considered for a while. Let me Ken? just uh, suggest one other way. We, and I did, failed to mention that we're rolling out this campaign at the end of June uh, in a more public way. Right. And uh, there are two biggest groups that are helping us right now, the California Apartment Association and also the San Mateo County Realtors Association. So we're going to have an event at the Housing Authority in late next June, and I, and I would love it, Ron, if we, could, um, if we could, by the end of June, have a goal that you all were comfortable with. Take, take a portion of that 400 number that you feel is achievable in your community and help us make that announcement to help um, leverage and challenge other cities. I mean, we, you know, we obviously have many cities in our community that can jump into this to make that 400 an achievable number. All right. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to have to have a quick chat with staff and find out what, what we can do. Um, uh, what, just one other question. You mentioned, is this the federal subsidy of $500,000 a month? Is that what you said? Well, that's, that's, the, the, that's the loss. That's, that's the, the unused portion. portion. It's half a million dollars. Portion. Yes, yeah. the I mean, total program is, I don't have the exact number, but it's probably between 65 and 70 million a annually. year, annually. annually. And if we keep using it, we keep we getting keep it. it? Yes, it's not going to go up, 
And yeah. the challenge is always to make it work in the marketplace, but uh, we got to hang on to every dollar. So to either and, keep it or lose it. Yeah. yeah, use it or lose it. And when he says it's not going to go up, it's actually a little bit more severe than that. This program is actually gradually shrinking under sequestration. It's one of the discretionary programs. They already abolished one of the key programs. It went from $2 billion <laughs> nationally to $50 million. This is money that otherwise was available to our local shelters, for example. So. We have to, as San Mateo County, become more competitive and really take these opportunities that do exist a whole lot more seriously. Not that he's not taking it seriously already, but, you know, these are precious resources. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it sounds like, it definitely sounds like a very laudable thing for us to be doing. And um, actually, Ron's uh, comment at the end was sort of my question. Um, Given that this is a, a discussion item, I mean, we, Greg, it is appropriate we can ask staff what feasibly could be done, correct? You can, you can ask staff questions and, and give some general direction at the staff level without making a, a decision or committing yourself to it. Um, Jeff, my, my sense is from listening to the presentation that essentially what we're being asked to do is uh, what I would think of as an outreach program, uh, which we have a number of other kinds of on a whole bunch of different issues. Um, uh, what's your sense of, of how f this would fit into what we could do? I think, I think it fits in well with the council's goals that have already been laid out uh, for staff around uh, affordable housing in the community. Uh, it sounds like there's a program and marketing material that's coming together quite soon. Um, certainly, you know, we have the resources and the knowledge base to be able to contact uh, our landlords in town. So it just kind of sounds like we just sort of need to marry all those things and do a little bit of work. But, you know, this sounds fairly routine uh, and something that, that, as I said before, already fits, I think, with the council's uh, goals around affordable housing. Thank you. That, that was my sense, too. And I mean, for what it's worth and paying attention to what, what Greg was saying, it, it certainly seems like something I'd like to see us do. Um, so, yeah, I, so I agree. I, I just want to see, is there any objection from the dais? No. no. All right. Well then well, let's move forward. I, I really appreciate you bringing this, um, forward. You know, there's always a lot of programs out there that, um, people may not be aware of and, you know, trying to keep this uh, diverse community and allow people who may not be, um, able to afford the market, uh, rent or market price for housing in, in our community is really important to us. So thanks for your work on it. Thank Mayor, I, if I may, just yeah, one, one last question. Um, is this, this program is obviously available only to current residents of San Mateo County? Uh, what if a family moves in? The residency question. Um, it is, it's a national program. It's under fair housing. And um, the easiest way to describe it is we have a waiting, a waiting pool that we draw names from. And there is a residency preference on the waiting pool. So um, the largest number of people that are selected into the program have a, a current uh, residency status in our community, in our county. Yeah. Just as by way of, because I don't actually know the answer anymore, but Ken, um, there's 4,400 possible participants. Do you know what the size of the waiting pool is at the moment? Do you have any idea? Uh, it's about 12,000. So you have enough demand to, uh, you know, go up to 12,000 more. All right. Go Thanks enjoy for some here. cake, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we'll move on to item seven, public comment for items not on the agenda. This evening I have two public um, uh, speaker cards. The first speaker tonight is Brendan Johansson. Good evening. Uh, council. So uh, the purpose of uh, my attendance today is I've I had talked to Ron Collins uh, sometime late last year uh, about this project that I had brought to the, the city's light back in June of uh, 2015. And it's probably good timing uh, right after this last presentation because uh, my goal is to uh, get the council to reconsider a restrictive covenant that was put on the property when I bought the land fr from the city back in 2008 uh, with Greg Rubens. Um, and I just think there's possibly some short-sightedness and maybe some creative solutions to taking this uh, extra lot that's on my property and turning it into sort of a micro cottage or some kind of small home. 
uh, that's that's built uh, with a net zero standard and sustainable building practices to sort of showcase uh, some of my talents and some of my passions, but also address uh, the issue right now of, of just that there's a lack of affordable homes around here, period, and not everybody wants to step into a brand new, you know, 3,000 square foot mega mansion that's that's creeping its way into the peninsula, you know, everywhere right now. Um, so. I brought it to the attention of a couple of the guys around here, but from my understanding, I think I need full council support, is what I've been told, um, and there needs to be a little bit more discussion. I haven't really had a lot of feedback from uh, the proposal so far, and so here I am. Okay. Thank you. Um, Through the chair? Yeah, Mark. Uh, and, and Greg, oh, we are allowed to ask clarifying questions, correct? Yes, you can. Um, Mr. Mayor, I wouldn't mind being uh, getting a just a brief reminder if uh, of where the property is and whatnot. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about where the property is? And sure. And there's I've I've given you guys some copies of of everything here. Uh, so I'm on the corner of uh, Alameda and Britain. As you're going up Britain, uh, my property is technically Rogers, and it's a strip of land that was owned by the city that uh, was sandwiched between Rogers and uh, Alameda de los Pulgas. I believe it was the old uh, road into the hills originally, uh, so it was sort of an awkward piece of land that, that uh, had some ingress and egress issues that were sorted out uh, back in 2008. Um, uh, in my letter here, I've, I've put together a couple different renderings of what uh, would be allowed with a secondary dwelling unit, and then what I would be proposing to sort of show the, you know, the impact or the lack of impact, you know, visually, and and trying to present something that's attractive uh, to the city. I've given a current uh, site plan of all the lots and a couple different floor plans. You know, I mean, this is. I put a lot of time into this, but I certainly it could be cleaned up. But I, you know, I wanted to get some feedback before I dug in and and tried to itemize things and batch things and make them you know a little bit more digestible, just to see if it was even something that the city was was really interested in. So uh, thank you. And just question, quick question for uh, Jeff: Has this been before the planning commission? No, this came to the council. I mean, it was discussed. Um, maybe in was it discussed in closed session or was it just public comment? Where this came up and I talked to a few. I mean, basically what happened is when the city sold this property, I'm not sure how many years ago it was now, um, a restriction was put on it that you couldn't you know, do a second dwelling or really um, subdivide the property, which is seems to be consistent with um, this council's uh, recent directive on not wanting to see a lot more uh, subdivisions in the neighborhoods. And this one's not this one's not something that you legally have to require because it's deed restricted. So that's kind of where this one ended a year ago. Thank you. So I, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. I, I received your email this morning. It was sort of the first that I became aware of it today. I, and I passed it along to our planning commission or our planning staff because I wanted to get a little bit more background. And I'll, I'll talk to Mr. Rubens too to get a little bit more information. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our second speaker tonight is um, our former school board president, Adam Rack. Speaking today on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Good evening. Mr. Collins, members of the council. Uh, first, it was great to see most of you at Hometown Days. And no, it's Mayor Johnson, not Mayor Collins. Yeah, I wasn't going to correct well, you. Like Mayor Johnson, <laughs> former Mayor Collins. Um, it was great to see all of you, most of you in a parade, and to, you know, uh, Cameron did a great job at the uh, pet parade judging. I know it was uh, some difficult decisions they were picking. Uh, I know that my daughter had some strong opinions, but uh, thank you for going along. Um, uh, on, on behalf of the chamber, I just wanted to, uh, we're, we're part of our outreach in, in this year, part of new goals of the chamber board in the chamber itself is to enhance our relationship with the city council, to come at every city council meeting uh, and let you know about some of the things we've been doing and some of the things that are coming up and to extend a personal invitation for all of you, staff and, and members of the community to attend uh, some of the chamber events. Um, so just in a couple of quick events, we had a Access San Carlos event at West Park Beach Bistro on May 6th focused on parking during construction of Wheeler Plaza, including updates on the construction schedule, parking plan, and communication strategy, and had uh, Lisa Costa-Sanders uh, as a 
principal, the principal planner as a guest speaker, and it was a well-attended event. On May 18th, we had our chamber meetup in spring fashion show with, at Dominico Winery with nearly 100 in attendance, and that also highlighted some of the local merchants and some of the uh, clothes and other things that they have. Uh, we have a, on June 8th a mixer coming up at Kamakashi's Kitchen, uh, Indian Kitchen on Old County Road. And then finally on June 5th, thank you, uh, will be the Farmer's Market finally opening on Sunday, so thank you to the council for working with us and helping to get that up and running. We're looking forward to starting a year-round farmer's market. Uh, we have right now 42 market vendors committed. We are expecting to get to 50 and eventually grow to 60 as things uh, progress. Uh, we'll be doing some merchant at, at the market. Uh, we'll be having the city council booths as well once a, once a month. Uh, and some food chef demos are some of the new things we're doing uh, as well. And some the, apparently there's going to be some homemade Oreos, honey, animal crackers, homemade animal crackers, dip, new, some new uh, different products that we think will be uh, higher end as well. And I just want to mention we've got Dignity Health, Sutter Health, Jamba Juice, Provident Credit Union, Home Chef Cooking School, Rock and Jump, and Chang Orth Orthodontics as our sort of initial sponsors for the, uh, for the event. So I look forward to seeing you all hopefully at the mixer and if not at, uh, at the farmer's market. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adam. Is there anyone else wish wishing to speak on public comment for items not on the agenda tonight? All right, hearing none, we'll move on to item eight, approval of the consent calendar. Consent items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless a members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. Would anyone like to remove an item for separate action? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, I move approval of the consent calendar and adoption of ordinance number 1504, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending chapter 13.04.025 of the Municipal Code fees for sewer connection. Second. I have a motion and a second. Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. Okay, we'll move on to item nine, reports to council. This evening we have a report on PCB pollution and stormwater. And is that Grace? Oh, I have the, uh, the clicker. There you are. Good evening, Grace. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Grace Lee, CD Engineer. Tonight we have Matt Fabry from, this, from CCAG and his team to present um, the PCB updates as well as stormwater quality issues. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Matt. Good evening, Matt. Good to see you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. I appreciate the invitation to come and speak to you about a uh, not so riveting but uh, important topic um, dealing with PCB pollution. Um, and so as introduction, I, I'm Matt Fabry. I manage the countywide water pollution prevention program for CCAG. And we exist basically to help all of the 21 agencies in the county comply with regional stormwater um, requirements or put in place by the State Regional Water Quality Control Board. And that uh, is done through what we call the Municipal Regional Permit, which is a permit that covers all of the municipalities in San Mateo, Santa Clara, Alameda, and Contra Costa counties. Um, and it covers a whole range of, of everything that potentially could you know, be a pollution issue with, relate, with relation to stormwater runoff and getting into our storm drains and flowing out to the, the creeks and to the, to the bay and to the ocean without any form of treatment. So um, one of the issues that we're dealing with under that permit is dealing with mercury and PCB problems in, the, in San Francisco Bay. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about PCBs. Uh, this is an issue that is uh, unfortunately um, something that we found is somewhat prevalent in San Carlos based on past industrial uh, activities. And so uh, I came and spoke to you, I think, a, a year or two ago and gave sort of an overview of what we knew at the time. And so we're going to give um, the latest and greatest on what we know and where we're headed under, under the permit. I should mention uh, before uh, my consultant John gets up here is that the, the regional permit is issued in five-year terms. And so we just had uh, the permit reissued uh, last November. It went into effect in January of this year. So 
Um, we did a lot of work under what we call MRP, or Municipal Regional Permit 1.0, uh, where we did a lot of pilot studies, and a lot of that work was done in San Carlos, and now we're under MRP 2.0, where we're moving into uh, much more focused implementation. And so I'm, I'm going to bring up my uh, consultant, John Conan, who's with EOA, uh, who's our main technical consultant that helped us on, on most of our permit issues, and he's going to give an overview of everything that we know so far with regard to PCBs. Good evening, John. All right. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity to come and talk to you about PCBs. Uh, not a topic that we talk about every day. If you bring it up at a party, for example, it doesn't really go over that well. But personally, I've been working on the PCBs problem for about 15 years, and it's very challenging. We've made some progress. And so what's the deal with PCBs? The, the problem that we're addressing is that it's found in fish in the bay at concentrations that are high enough that it's thought to pose a health risk to people to catch those fish and eat them or feed them to their families. Because of that, the state has issued a fish consumption advisory. And because of the advisory, the bay is formally considered impaired under the Clean Water Act. And uh, when a water body is impaired that way, something has to be done to address the impairment. It often takes the form of a TMDL, or Total Maximum Daily Load, which is kind of an odd name, but what it really means is a com comprehensive program to address an impaired water body and uh, restore water quality. And uh, parts of the TMDL are addressed through MPDES permits and the municipal regional permit, the stormwater permit that Matt just mentioned, it's an example of an MPDES permit. It's one for stormwater, it's a wastewater one, et cetera. Uh, so the stormwater facets of the TMDL are implemented through the municipal regional permit. So PCBs are an oil, basically, and they have some properties that made them really desirable for use in electrical equipment. Uh, they don't conduct electricity, and they don't conduct heat very well, real high boiling point. So they work real well as an insulator uh, for transformers and capacitors, and were used very widely uh, all the way from the, about the 1930s through the 1970s. Uh, the second most popular use of PCBs was as a plasticizer in paints and cocks, building materials. And what that means is if you add the PCB oils to a cock, for example, it makes it more rubbery and durable and weatherproof, basically. So it was real popular for that use as well. And then there were a number of other uses. Uh, it was widely used in industrial areas. So a little more of the history. Back in about the year 2000, uh, it was known that PCBs were a problem in fish in the bay, and it was suspected that stormwater was contributing to it. But there really wasn't any hard evidence at that time. Uh, PCBs bind to sediments in the environment. So to start gathering data and figure out what was going on, a program of collecting sediment samples all over the Bay Area was started right around the year 2000 or 2001. <coughs> and uh, these photographs show some pictures of workers collecting sediment samples from streets and from storm drainage infrastructure. The bottom left photograph is actually on Branston Road here in San Carlos, right across the street from GC Lubricants. And uh, in that case, the workers collecting a sediment sample from a storm drain inlet. GC Lubricants I'll mention later, but it's a, a known PCBs contamination site that's been under cleanup order. So here's a little bit about the results of those sediment surveys. The bigger, redder dots show higher concentrations. Uh, the results were variable, higher in some areas, lower in others, which suggested there were hot spots that we could try to address. Uh, highest concentrations were in old industrial land uses, close to the bay often. So the uh, old industrial area here in San Carlos is a good example of one of those where we've found higher concentrations of PCBs. 
Uh, over the years, and again, PCBs were used all the way from the 30s to the 1970s. And at the end of 1970s, by the way, they were essentially banned. Um, so over all those years, they were widely dispersed in the environment, and they moved off of parcels where they were used to, into the public right away and into storm drain systems and eventually were carried down to the bay. Um, and from there, when the sediments arrive in the bay, they work their way up through the food chain, and concentrations get higher and higher as you go higher up in the food chain. So like large sport fish tend to have the highest concentrations. It's a process called bioaccumulation. So this shows a little bit about the framework of the TMDL, which again is a program to restore water quality in an impaired water body. And uh, this was worked out for the Bay Area PCBs TMDL, and it shows the phased approach for addressing PCBs in stormwater over 20 years. Uh, the clock on this started clicking in 2010, so the goal is to reach the goals of the TMDL by 2030. The goal is real challenging. It's a 90% reduction in PCBs in stormwater over that period. Uh, so this framework starts off with things like desktop analysis, and into box two is pilot testing of best management practices and controls. Box three is called focused implementation, areas of greatest benefit, and finally trying to reach the goal of box four, which is full-scale implementation of control measures across the Bay Area that will result in meeting the TMDL 90% reduction goal. So Matt mentioned that the stormwater permit's been reissued recently. Uh, we call the last permit term MRP 1.0, Municipal Regional Permit 1.0. And during that permit term, we were focusing on pilot testing. Then uh, as of the beginning of this year, the permit was reissued. We moved into MRP 2.0. Now we're trying to accomplish focused implementation, which has been defined by the permit as trying to accomplish one-sixth of the total reduction that's required of stormwater. So what can you do about PCBs and stormwater? Here are some of the things that we're looking at, some of the control measures and best management practices. Uh, the ones that are in blue we're referring to as kind of the big three. Those are the ones that we see being implemented most widely in the, in the near future, so I'll focus on those. Uh, number one is trying to find properties that are sources of PCBs. And there's still properties out there where PCBs have been in the soils and sediments for years and are still coming off the properties. So we try to find those and then refer them to the Regional Water Board so that they can take it from there and enforce further investigation and cleanup of the site. Number two is a program to manage PCBs and building materials during demolition or renovation. So I mentioned before the PCBs are found in, or they were used widely in cocks and sealants. And actually if you take a, a sample of a cock or sealant from a building in any urban area, really in the Western world, and test it for PCBs, if that building was built between say the 1950s and the 1970s, you'll likely find PCBs. Uh, we've done testing here in the Bay Area and sure enough found quite a bit of PCBs. So it's in buildings out there right now, especially built between the 50s and the 70s. Uh, and the thought is that during demolition or renovation, it could be released into the environment. So we're working on developing a control program to manage that at that time. And the third of the big three controls is treatment. And the, the way of doing this that's getting a lot of attention now is green infrastructure. You may have heard the term. Seems to be kind of the wave of the future. And I'm actually going to flip forward to a photograph that shows an example here on Branston Road in San Carlos. It's the bottom right-hand corner. So a typical example would be this is called a curb extension bioretention area. And basically, the curb was extended out in a few areas into the roadway. And then a landscaped area was designed and is, is graded so that stormwater runoff 
enters into the landscaped area, then sinks down through the materials and pollutants are filtered out that way. So there's a lot of different types of green infrastructure. This is one example. And uh, people are particularly interested in green infrastructure because it has multiple benefits. Uh, you can treat a, a number of different pollutants, PCBs included, and um, it can help reduce flows, which is good from a flood control aspect, uh, especially as concerns about sea level rise and so forth are coming in the future. And it's aesthetically nice, uh, and it may be more fundable than a lot of other controls that we think about for stormwater, because you can try to piggyback it on, say, other infrastructure improvement projects, uh, transportation projects, and things like that. All right, so I mentioned before that we're doing pilot work, or we started pilot work under the last <coughs> permit term, and it was focused in five different watersheds in the Bay Area. There were two in Richmond, one in Oakland, one in San Jose, and then one here in the much smaller city of San Carlos. And it's, uh, I'll zoom in in, in a minute, but it's the old industrial area uh, right by the Bay that we're focusing on. A lot of this work was funded by a grant from EPA. So here's the pilot watershed, as we call it, in San Carlos. And it's the drainage that goes to the Pul Pulgas Creek pump station, shown in green there. It's mainly old industrial land use. Uh, so like I said, it's one of a handful of old industrial areas in the Bay Area that have, are known to have higher PCBs. And we've been working with staff from the Public Works Department here in San Carlos for a, a number of years now to pilot test a few different controls and try to figure out how effective they are. Here's a list of the controls that we've been pilot testing here in San Carlos. Uh, first one I mentioned earlier, trying to find source properties and then referring to the state for them to take it from there for cleanup. Uh, street flushing and capture, the two photographs on the left show us actually working with public works staff here on that one. Uh, the idea is that if there are sediments in the streets with PCBs uh, to flush them off, as you can see in the upper picture, and then capture them. And then we did monitoring to determine the load of sediments and how much PCBs they had them before and after this kind of process. Uh, the guy in the bottom is collecting sediments with a vacuum, actually. Uh, the results on this are still pending, as is the case with most of the pilot work. Next one is the Branston Road Green Street retrofit. That's the one I showed you the picture of before. And uh, there's been some issues with this pilot work. Uh, this past winter, there was some flooding problems that cropped up in driveways adjacent to these bioretention installations. There's seven of them. And the other thing that happened is we did some monitoring to determine the effectiveness, and we got very strange results. So we started looking real carefully into the construction and comparing that to the design and discovered that there were some discrepancies and how they were built relative to the design. Um, so this was a pilot work, and we learned some pretty important lessons from doing this. Uh, we're currently working with San Carlos staff to figure out the best way to fix this and to find funding to do that. Um, there may be some remaining funds from the grant that's funded some of this pilot work, but there may not. But uh, we're looking into that right now. Uh, and the picture in the upper right is the Pulgas Creek pump station, and that's in relation to the last bullet there, which is looking at diverting stormwater flows to the wastewater treatment plant, or limited flows, and um, treating the PCBs that way. And once again, the results in all of this pilot work are still pending. So I'm going to show you a little more about our process for how we look for the best areas to focus controls for PCBs. And 
uh, this map shows part of San Carlos, including the old industrial area. Uh, what we've done is screened every parcel in San Mateo County, including all of those in San Carlos, uh, based on land use and certain other things. Um, like we've looked at aerial photos about past uses on sites and so forth. So it was a, it was a large desktop study to try to determine <coughs> which properties are most suspect for potentially releasing PCBs. And the, the ones in yellow are the ones that uh, we designated as potentially of interest, then the ones in orange are of higher interest. Uh, there's also some sites shown on here that are listed on what's called the Enviro Store site. It's, some, it's a site kept by the state that shows um, sites where cleanups for contamination are occurring. These are all ones that have been flagged for PCBs. So Delta Stars at the top, uh, that's a former manufacturer of PCBs transformers. They still manufacture transformers, but no longer with PCBs. Then the variant site is a little bit below that. Uh, that went into a cleanup starting in about 2007, and I'm actually not sure what the status is, but it's being redeveloped to a medical center. It may actually have happened. You guys probably know more about that than I do right at this moment. Better be cool now. Yeah, it did, it did happen. Yeah, I mean, the reason, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we are looking into all of these sites, and the reason we bring it up is potentially these sites were releasing PCBs into the storm drain before they were cleaned up and redeveloped. And now they've gone through that process, they should be clean. And we can actually take credit for this kind of thing towards the load reduction requirements that are in the permit. So we're looking at all of those kind of sites very carefully. Uh, so GC Lubricants, I mentioned earlier, is down there on Branston Road. And there's a couple other sites as well. So all these little squares in green and yellow and red and orange colors show the results of samples in the environment. These are all sediment samples. And just so it's clear, the, you know, the way that we um, classified the parcels, yellow and orange, is really just to inform sampling programs. It, it shows potential for PCBs, but it doesn't confirm it at all. And we would never say that a particular area is a problem with PCBs or a particular parcel without actually doing sampling in the field and analyzing the samples in the lab and confirming it that way. So one interesting thing here is there's a bunch of green samples just below the variant site. Uh, those were collected during some dredging of sediments from a channel and uh, that was done by San Carlos and they had them analyzed for PCBs and shared the results for us. Uh, they were pretty clean and the, that area drains the variant site, or the former variant site now, so it's an encouraging sign that it looks like there's probably not a lot of PCBs coming off that site now. But uh, you can see that there's some red samples as well further down. Uh, some of them are in the vicinity of GC Lubricants, which is a PCB site. Uh, a couple of them are at the bottom of the watershed. That's where the pump station is. And then there's some others in the more southern part of the drainage. Uh, one of them, we uh, think we may know what the source property is, and we'll be working with staff from San Carlos to think about whether it's going to make sense to refer this one. I mentioned before the, the general scheme of things where we try to find source properties and refer them to the, uh, the state for cleanup. But we don't want to blindside anybody, so we'll work carefully with staff here before we do that. Uh, we have actually referred two sites previously. One was Delta Star and the other was GC Lubricants. Uh, but those ones were well-known PCB cleanup sites, so it wasn't like we were going to catch anybody off guard that way. And um, in, in those cases, we found PCBs and storm drain sediments nearby the sites. So the real purpose of the referral was, hey, you're cleaning up these sites. Please, as part of that cleanup, make sure that Nothing's getting out into the storm drains and then eventually to the bay, which is what we're trying to address. <laughs> so when we find an area that has PCBs based on lab sampling, uh, we've, we define it as a management area. And the two purple areas have had multiple hits of PCBs. It's the north and the south part of the drainage to the pump station. 
the Baldus Creek pump station. Uh, the red area, we've only had one hit so far, so it's a potential area that we'll be looking at, uh, but we need more sampling there to confirm. And then some of the other areas that are in green are ones that, based on our best desktop study, have parcels that could be suspect, but we don't have confirmatory sampling yet. And then this backs away from the previous picture and shows it for the whole county. Uh, like I said, we've done this kind of screening process for the entire county and have done a fair amount of sampling across the county as well. And here's where we're at so far as with regard to identifying the areas that we think need to be focused on for PCBs. So the, the only confirmed areas that we have right now are here in San Carlos. And then there's some red areas that we think are potential, but we need more sampling to confirm. And then there's a number of green areas where we need more sampling to figure out whether or not these are of interest. So what's next? Um, well, we'd like to continue working with staff from San Carlos and other local agencies in San Mateo County to continue addressing PCBs and stormwater and thereby meet the requirements that are in the reissued stormwater permit. So some of the things that we'll be doing is trying to identify additional management areas. So that's, again, trying to figure out whether any of these green areas are areas that we need to address and whether the red areas are really areas that we need to address as well. And then within those areas, trying to find source properties is always one of our top priorities. Uh, we're developing a region-wide program to manage PCB materials, building materials, during demolition. So that's another permit requirement. Uh, there's a whole movement for gradually greening the urban landscape, which is kind of being push-started by this uh, new reissued permit. Uh, San Carlos is required to do a green infrastructure plan, which will take into consideration PCBs. Then we're tracking redevelopment, as I mentioned before. Uh, evaluating other possible controls. Uh, I mentioned the potential diversion of stormwater to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, there's a Redwood, in Redwood City, there's a retention pond. It's actually called the Redwood Shores Ecological Preserve, I believe. And, um, it drains the Delta Star area and some of the surrounding area, which is suspect for PCBs in San Carlos right now. And we're going to look into the possibility that maybe sediments are accumulating in that pond and doing something like periodically dredging it could be a way of getting at the PCBs in those sediments. Then we are continuing to evaluate things that are happening anyway that we could potentially take credit for through the permit. Uh, I mentioned before uh, dredging of sediments from channels. If that's in an area where there could be PCBs, then we'll encourage sampling and taking credit for it if we can. And then I mentioned some site cleanups as well. Uh, we look to take credit for those. Then there's a process going on called reasonable assurance analysis. And what this means is also required by the permit is figuring out what is the suite of control measures that you can implement and over what time period and at what cost in order to meet the goals in the TMDL. And what we're anticipating is going to come out of this, and it involves modeling and it's, it's, you know, it's a fairly rigorous analytic process. But what we're thinking is probably going to come out of this is it's going to show that the cost to meet the TMDL goals within the period that's specified, again, is 20 years, are going to be so high that it's not going to be feasible. And if that's the case, then this may give us the ammunition and really give the, the state the ammunition to extend the TMDL. But in the meantime, they're making it very clear that we have to make a good faith effort to do everything we can to address PCBs. Uh, and if we're doing that and the analysis shows that the costs are prohibitive, then they'll consider extending the time period. So finally, another thing that we're doing is looking for grant funding. 
Um, right now, we're actually working on an application for EPA to get more funds from the uh, same source. It's called the Water Quality Improvement Fund for San Francisco Bay that uh, funded some of the pilot work that I mentioned before. So I know that was a, a lot of PCBs in just a few minutes, but <laughs> we are happy to take any questions or try to explain any of this a little bit better. Great. Thank you, John. Uh, questions for Matt and John. Uh, we'll start with Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Matt and John. Um, always good to hear from you. Um, I have a, a number of questions, but let me sort of start with a, a simple one. Um, well, I was struck by when I looked at your your second slide, the one that had the pictures of all the fish on it. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of folks who live in San Carlos, who live on the east part, east side of San Carlos, who uh, I'm actually surprised there aren't a number of them here. Um, who uh, their concern fundamentally is what's the danger to them and their families from living near some of these sources. And what I was struck by is, is your focus, it seems like primarily the problem is not necessarily so much living adjacent to some of these existing sites, but the fact that it's all sort of dissipating into the bay and it sort of builds up in concentration there, and so the bay becomes kind of a it's the, it's the bottom of the food chain or the bottom of the pool. Um, so can you give us any kind of color or sense on what the risks are for people who are inhabiting areas near these sites as opposed to the, what the risk is from the bay, risk to the bay? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Matt and I met with Mayor Johnson previously and he asked the same question. Uh, the risks are probably lower, but I'm not really able to fully speak to that. Uh, the concentrations that someone would need to be exposed to, say like kids playing in dirt that's contaminated or something like that. Uh, you know, often there are, when, when a site's cleaned up, there are health risk-based cleanup numbers that are determined uh, for that kind of exposure. You know, if a kid were to accidentally ingest a little bit of soil or that kind of thing. And typically those numbers are much, much higher than the numbers that we're concerned about for that same soil to get into the bay and bioaccumulate. And, and the reason for that is because the bioaccumulation process increases the concentrations many, many fold time. And uh, then also the, the pathway for getting it into the human body is you know, by directly eating the fish, which you can get a lot more of the materials in that way than you would by, say, accidentally ingesting a little bit of soil. So, I mean, I don't want to go too far with this because I'm not really an expert in human health exposure. You know, I've, we're, we're real focused on the water quality problem, as, as you know. But I would say, the, in general, the concentrations that are acceptable uh, from the direct exposure route are much higher than those that are acceptable for what can get in the bay and cause problems. I, I appreciate that. I'll just mention, when we'll come back to this at the end, uh, see if anybody else in the dais is interested. I very much appreciate this information. I'd actually love to have somebody who could come in who was an expert on that aspect of things and talk to me as well. Um, because that's, that's a, uh, I don't want to make it sound like I don't care about the Bay, because I do, but, but I, I have a great concern about the people who live in San Carlos. Um, the, uh, um, one of the other things I was struck by uh, in my involvement with this over the years is, uh, and this may be getting more into the, the purely political realm or it may, may have legal dimensions to it as well. Um, you know, you look at the map that you have of the Bay Area and some of the areas, the highest concentrations and stuff. Uh, obviously, it's not randomly distributed. And so that tells me that um, uh, by extrapolation that even though it was, as you mentioned, John, it was widely used in a lot of products that were used for construction of all different kinds, that, that the primary sources of this are manufacturing sites, okay? Um, and that leads me to say, or ask the question, um, manufacturing sites means there's a manufacturer. And I didn't see very much here about uh, a process or effort to go after the manufacturers. And I don't know if that's because there was some kind of settlement reached between some level of government and manufacturers saying, okay, you guys kick in X dollars and accept some liability and you're off the hook for stuff, or whether that 
path is not being pursued. But I'd like to understand that because, frankly, I look at some of this stuff and I go, okay, I'm willing to agree that nobody deliberately wanted to use a product that they knew ahead of time was going to cause damage, you know, damage to the environment and risk human health. But if they did, why aren't they being held responsible for that? Uh, PCBs were manufactured by Monsanto uh, all the way from the 30s through the late 70s. And at some point later in that time period, people figured out that they're carcinogenic and somewhat toxic. And it's actually, there's some controversy. Some people think that Monsanto knew about these problems much sooner than they were revealed. Uh, there is a lawsuit right now. It's kind of a, I mean, I'm not an attorney, but it's kind of a class action sort of thing that some local agencies have been joining in uh, to sue Monsanto for the damage that's been done by PCBs. So that is actually in the works right now. Um, Greg, would you mind uh, sharing a little bit, weighing in here on, yeah, I think you know the question I'm getting at, which is that normally when party A damages party B, even if party B is the general public, part, the party B has recourse against party A to say, hey, you've got to pay to fix this. Yeah, under um, state law and uh, the CERCLA, the national law for, for toxic cleanups, the property owner has um, liability, so to the extent that some of the businesses that were mentioned um, own the property or were the discharger. They do have exposure for the cleanup costs. Um, and the regulators, and um, when, they, when they identify a site, they, they come up with a plan to deal with the cleanup of the toxics. And it may sometimes take decades for the, for the uh, process to work out because you, you can't just take a big hole and, and take it out in many cases because that's not really going to solve the problem if the plume extends off property, for example, or was caused by um, somebody doing a, a, a spill or, or PCBs or some other. So there's a lot of different chemicals. And so the short answer to your question is there is culpability under the law and the uh, property owner or the discharger has liability. Um, the problems that we've sometimes seen is where the discharger is long gone and we have a property owner who, who inherited a problem and sometimes that makes it more difficult to deal with it. I, I can certainly understand that. I guess the, you know, the, what's always been in the back of my mind from having when I, my time on CCAG, as Matt had explained to me, and there's lots of different ways of valuing the cleanup liability, but the number that I always remember is something for San Carlos alone, something on the order of like 30 or $40 million. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a big number, potentially. Um, and in fact, it's so big that, you know, uh, to me, um, I'm not interested in shouldering a significant portion of that uh, without first trying to make sure that the people who actually profited from doing this shoulder as big a portion of it as we can get them to do. Um, I don't know how that, I know that legal suits, you know, cost money and stuff and you have to, have to factor that in. But I would offer that as some feedback, gentlemen, is that I think it's great what you're doing, looking to clean things up because we have to clean it up. But at the end of the day, uh, you know, I'd like to see as little public money used in this as possible because the public wasn't the one who caused the problem. Um, and, and it's not, I hate using this word in politics, it's not fair to ask the public to shoulder the, shoulder the burden. Um, yeah, you know, I probably didn't make it clear enough, but if you look at the first bullet in our control box, it's the source property identification and referral strategy. So I think we're trying to get at exactly what you're saying that way, which is we try to identify properties that PCBs are coming off of and then refer them to the state so that the state can enforce investigation if it's needed and a cleanup. So the, the theory is there that once we've made that referral, they take it from there and try to identify the responsible parties. I mean, often, as you said, they're long gone with a legacy pollutant like this, but they try to do what they can under law to have responsible parties or property owners or what have you shoulder the cost of the cleanup. So that is the direction we're trying to go to the extent we can. And I'll just mention, we'll make sure that uh, Mr. Rubens gets a copy of, of the 
class action lawsuit that John mentioned against Monsanto as manufacturer, and maybe that's something that could be brought back to the Council for consideration as to whether or not they want to be a part of that. I, I, I'm not aware of any San Mateo municipalities that have participated in that lawsuit, but I believe City of San Jose is part of it. I believe City of Berkeley is part of it. So there are Bay Area folks that are involved, and I believe it was started down in Southern California with City of San Diego, I think. I could be wrong on that, but we can get information to Mr. Rubens on that. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Bob? Well, I, I was just going to... So, I mean, Joe Smith owns a piece of property in Industrial Road, and but he closed his business 15 years ago. But he still owns the property, maybe. So the, it's identified that there's PCBs there. So does that auto automatically go to that bullet point then, to the goes to the state? Yeah. We can. So, so it's identification. If he if if there's if it's never identified, then it's never identified. And, and I know a lot of, I see a, a, a machine here knocking down a building. I certainly understand when you move it around, then you definitely have to you know, identify it. But a lot of, I would imagine a lot of properties don't even realize they may have it. And of course it could have flowed as the plume goes, could have flowed right under their, under their property. And of course then it's trying to identify where, the, where, the, where it started, right? Is that basically what they try to do? I mean, in this case, we're talking more about overland flow via slow Okay. Thanks, Bob. Matt? So I just have one question. Everybody's asked things relative to San Carlos, but uh, I was looking at your map there more from a regional perspective, and uh, I noticed that, let's see, Yes, this one, exactly, great, thank you. Um, as is typical, you know, we've got a number of features in our county that we don't control because they're not our county, they're San Francisco's. <laughs> and one of those is the airport, it's very large, has a lot of frontage on the bay. So I was just curious what kind of activity regarding what you guys are doing has happened there at the airport. It, it's not covered under the regional permit, the stormwater permit, or not the municipal permit. Um, I, the airport would have a, a number of its own permits, so we don't do anything in relation to the airport. It's kind of non-jurisdictional from our standpoint. Is that serious? Wow. Jackie Spears' office needs to uh, look into that then. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hope so because that's a that's a huge hole in the whole process. If not, so. Yeah, they had, there have been some activity related to PCBs. I know that they did some demolition out there recently, and the regional water board was out there and working with them on it and so forth. Plus, it was a very big and active place during World War II, so we can pretty much presume that there's something going on out there. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> I'm glad we have this slide up because um, the question I wanted to ask is a question that we discussed when I, when I met with you guys. So for the whole county, the the purple areas, they're both in San Carlos, is that right? So, so in terms of identified um, PCBs, San Carlos is kind of ground zero for the county, is that right? And as you explained it to me, um, sort of the region has targets and then individually the counties have targets in terms of PCB reduction, is that right? Correct. So as you understand it, the big, best way to meet the county's targets is to address PCBs in San Carlos. That's part of the picture. We're also trying to find, are there other Polgus Creek watersheds in other parts of the county? Yeah. Uh, so far we haven't found them, but they may very well be out there. So. And then, you know, you mentioned um, EPA grants. Um, so it seems to me, therefore, that we would be very competitive um, relative to other cities for looking for state and federal money to help um, put in, say, for instance, green, green infrastructure that would um, uh, reduce, help to capture some of these PCBs. Is that the case? Do, it, yeah, I would think so. Um, 
I mean, right now we're focusing on a grant application that will help with a number of things regionally. So it's um, the, all of the counties are partnering on it, but uh, I would think that there would be instances where there would be grant funds that San Carlos would be very competitive for, given the situation here. Matt, do you want to? I'll, I'll just add to that. I think um, most of the funding opportunities that we're seeing now related to stormwater are focused on multi-benefit stormwater projects, and so green infrastructure definitely fits into that category because it's something that can improve water quality. It can help address potential <coughs> flooding issues. It can help recharge groundwater. Um, the challenge that we often have in these areas where we've got the PCB problems is that there are areas right next to the bay that have very poor soils for infiltration, and so um, our green infrastructure implementation in those areas often doesn't you know, fit the bill of a, of a multi-benefit project, and sure. so you may get more competition uh, for projects that are, work in areas where you can help you know, recharge a, a groundwater basin that's being used for water supply or things like that. But it, we're definitely looking at these opportunities, and we're, uh, there is a grant opportunity that's coming up in the beginning of July that's um, pot of Prop 1 uh, water bond funds that's focused on stormwater, and they're looking for multi-benefit stormwater capture type projects. So we are working with all the jurisdictions. Uh, to identify potential project opportunities. So we're working with your staff to have them help us identify where they're interested in putting a project forward um, so we can hopefully put that into a grant application. Okay. Well, please do. And, you know, I hope our staff will also be on the lookout for opportunities to um, get some regional, state, and federal funding to kind of help improve our stormwater infrastructure. Um, I had Ron's light. Did you want to make a quick point on, on this particular topic, or do you have a separate question? Okay. Ron? Uh, thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Um, uh, just a little bit more on a point Mark brought up about, you know, about the people who live here uh, and the potential danger to them. I, my, my question is, um, if I were a member of the Eastside community and I came in tonight and I saw, you know, San Carlos virtually covered in, in every color, um, what do I say to those families when they say to me, are we in danger? What's my response? Are we in danger of breathing it? Are we in danger of drinking it? Is it uh, is it going to you know is it going to get in our plants? Tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. Should I, I plant a garden in my backyard? Uh, what do we say to them? I don't feel fully qualified to answer that question since we really focus on the water quality aspect. Uh, I mean, I think what you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll say, it, but but if you go to any urban area in the country and test for PCBs, you're going to find it. And it's just, it was so widely used in urban areas everywhere. I mean, maybe that's not very comforting, but I don't, I don't think this old industrial area is much different from any other area in that respect. Um, but I, I think you probably need somebody who's a little more of a, an expert on kind of the direct human health uh, implications to speak to that question. Rather, maybe we can pull up the slide that shows all the samples that we've taken. Yeah, so I mean, the only comment I'd make on this is that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of sampling to try to find where the problem areas are, and so this shows where the samples have been collected, all those little squares. And so, um, as John mentioned, the concentrations that we're looking at in terms of um, something being a trigger for us to, to look at it more closely are far lower than what are considered the human health standards, and so I think if you, if you get someone that's more of an epidemiologist or somebody that can come in and look at this, they'd probably look at, at this data and say the concentrations that we're seeing, and, and you know, there's a lot of samples that, that come up, you know, very low, or, or, you know, the green ones are ones that are, are really low, that, um, that if they looked at this data, I'm guessing that the answer would be is that we don't see any concentrations in these samples that exhibit a human health concern, but as, as John mentioned, I'm, I'm not competent in, in making those statements, but I think you know, we do see that <coughs> the, the concentrations from a water quality perspective with the bioaccumulation are much lower, and I don't even know, John, you know what the, uh, the human health um, concentrations are better than I do, um, but I think they're like an order, order of magnitude higher um, than what we're looking at, uh, you know, I don't well, know if you know that off the top of your head, but so. I mean, this is where I feel a little bit cautious. Just for example, if, say you have a site that has PCBs in the soils and it's decided there's going to be a cleanup, and you have to figure out, so what level do I have to clean up to? What level can I leave behind and is that safe? 
Well, there are general guidelines that you can compare to, but the bottom line is usually a site-specific risk assessment, what, what it's called, you know, a study done for that particular site, which takes into account how people might be exposed right at that site and what the pollutants are. Uh, so usually the final cleanup numbers are pretty rigorously decided by site-specific work like that. So it's, I feel reluctant to say, like, you know, if you were to go to any particular site in San Carlos that has PCBs, what would the result be of that site-specific risk assessment? I don't know the result. I think Matt's right, and probably 99% of the time it would be just fine from a human health standpoint. But until you do the study, you can't really say for sure. And it's not really the kind of work that we do day to day. We're real focused on water quality. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark, you know, final question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, a question and, a, and an observation. Uh, the question is, um, uh, Matt, you mentioned before about getting uh, Greg Rubin's information on the uh, class action lawsuit. Um, is uh, CCAG or some county en level entity involved in that lawsuit? And, and if not, do you have a sense why, why they are or aren't? CCAG is not involved in it. I have uh, brought it to the attention of CCAG's legal counsel, um, but we have not taken action on it. So that's something you know we can we can look at bringing back. I have not looked at the case in any detail myself. I just have read newspaper articles about it that sort of cover, you know, the, the general focus of it. So um, it's something that we could look at, um, and and I think it would be helpful if we could get you know legal counsel folks from out the, throughout the county that could weigh in on whether or not participation in this makes sense or not. Um, and I, to, I think the issues, you know, we'd have to look at is if, the, if we did participate, what is, you know, the financial resource commitment that we'd have to go along with that to, to be a participant in that? I, I don't have an answer to that. I'll yeah, that, and that's fine. I, I think it'd actually be great if that, that kind of process did get followed because it's something to consider whether one does it or not. Um, the request I wanted to see, uh, Mr. Mayor, is, uh, as I mentioned before, I would be interested in a follow-up discussion where we had somebody who was more um, uh, knowledgeable, and I don't mean that as a criticism, knowledgeable about the human health effects of this, uh, come talk to us. I don't know whether anybody else is, but if there's a couple of us who are interested, maybe we should schedule it. Uh, I, I, for one, would, simply because we're going to have a lot more development coming in on the east side, and this question isn't going to go away. In fact, I think it's going to come up more often. So I'd like to be able to have be able to explain it to them, to, to uh, the residents who are most likely going to have concerns. And I want to be able to give them a good answer. All right. Gentlemen? I'm not a scientist, so uh, I, I don't know how you find out unless you dig. I mean, so I don't know how, if the answers, if anybody could give the answer, but maybe they can. Whatever. I, I don't know. It's, All right. Well, I'll, I'll add a third voice to... Uh, seeing if we can find somebody to come talk to us about the, the non-water quality impacts of PCBs in the soil. Mr. Mulby, sound good? Got it. Okay. All right. Yeah, that okay. makes sense. I mean, Matt and I are not the right person to answer that question, so I would encourage you to do that. All right. All right, well, I think that's all the questions we have, but thank you guys very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to item 10A, consideration of adopting resolution, adopting the San Carlos strategic plan. Ms. Peterson. Not all of the mayor and council members. My name is Tara Peterson. I'm the assistant city manager. And before you this evening, briefly, is uh, just a, a summary of the strategic plan that we've uh, recently gone through the process to prepare for you. So in uh, February and March, we had two new facilitators come uh, to the city and help uh, the council and the executive team to review our strategic plan from the past year and to discuss uh, new goals and objectives for the 2016-17 strategic plan. The city's mission statement, vision statement, core uh, values, goals, and objectives were reviewed and updated as necessary. Uh, and then on March 30th, staff met with the facilitators and we developed work plans to meet each of council's objectives. 
And uh, the departments then broke down these uh, goals and work plans into tasks and actions that then were assigned to staff and then target dates were established. Uh, the work plans are available to you in your packet in the tables. Uh, and just briefly to go over the council's vision and mission statements. The mission statement is that the city of San Carlos provides high quality services and facilities in a fiscally, fiscal, fiscally sustainable, responsive and friendly manner to foster a safe and healthy community. The, mission, uh, the vision statement is that San Carlos will be a vibrant family and business-friendly community, admired as a great place to live, learn, work, and play. The core values, in no particular order, are fiscal responsibility and sustainability, protecting the city's assets and resources, strategic thinking and planning for the future, high ethical standards and care for the community, protecting the environment, community engagement, and community building, a strong sense of community, a safe community, and support the well-being and development of city employees. Uh, these are in alphabetical order, and these are the council's strategic goals. The first is affordable housing. The city will encourage multifamily housing consistent with the general plan and mixed-use concepts along transit corridors. For infrastructure, the city will identify and plan for strategic infrastructure improvements and maintenance. For parking, the city will develop parking improvements for the downtown, the South Laurel, and the Transit Center that consider the interests of businesses, residents, and the city. For public outreach, community engagement, and social media, the city will develop and enhance public outreach, community engagement, and social media tools and platforms to facilitate open communication and information sharing with the public. And with public safety, the city will provide high quality, stable, and cost-effective public safety services to the community. And finally, traffic and transit. The city will identify, plan, and complete strategic <coughs> traffic improvements while encouraging more use of public transit and alternate modes of transportation. The work plans then were developed under each of these categories. So under affordable housing, uh, first objectives to work to ensure that the city and the residents are informed of about the affordable housing policy, to build uh, multi-family housing along transit corridors and close to the downtown core with mixed use concepts spread throughout areas already zoned for this use, to take a more active role regionally in encouraging and developing affordable housing, such as what was discussed this evening, infrastructure, build consensus around what the city's infrastructure and maintenance priorities are, identify re reliable sources of funding for the infrastructure needs, maximize underutilized facilities and resources, and complete major infrastructure projects. Under parking, we'll develop and adopt a parking strategy for the downtown South Laurel Street and Transit Center. In addition, we'll also increase parking supply in these areas. We'll develop wayfinding so people can find their way around to parking. Encourage programs, incentives, and other modes of transportation to reduce parking demand in those areas. For public outreach and community engagement, we're, we're going to encourage more involved and knowledgeable community to build trust and confidence in the civic policy process and to build shared civic pride. We also plan to develop effective communications policy and utilize consistent multi-pronged approaches to public outreach and engagement. For public safety, we plan to continue to provide effective and efficient public safety services and evaluate options for managing the increasing fire safety costs. And finally, under traffic and transit, we're going to complete major transportation projects, study and identify traffic mitigation improvements, improve public transportation, encourage alternate modes of transportation, and inform and educate the public about traffic options. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Questions? Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Tara. Um, great presentation. Uh, I'm just curious what staff thinks it's going to be doing uh, in the second half of the fiscal year 2016-17. <laughs> uh, not all these are going to be done very quickly. Oh, we have Some oh, of these take oh. a little bit longer than others. No, no. In, in all seriousness, I, I, uh, I, uh, uh, I thought the problem. 
the revised process that we went through was uh, much improved over the, the former one, which was good in its own way. And uh, I look forward to seeing this stuff come to fruition. Thank you, Mark. Other questions? Um, so I'll echo what Mark said, um, and specifically to Jeff. I appreciate your willingness to, you know, break apart the process and uh, reinvigorate it. And I thought it was uh, it was great. And um, it, can I ask, you know, what the cadence is going forward? Um, you know, we we now have this plan in place. Are we going to have? Is the thought that we would have um, a similar? Are we going to go back to our mini retreat sessions? Are we going to, you know, have another, um, you know, multi-day retreat or full-day retreat? What's your thought there? So, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to keep the council on the um, every six-month mini retreat schedule. Um, you know, where we'd have one actually coming up probably just after the summer, um, towards the end of the summer. And that one really won't be tied to the strategic planning process, just be an opportunity for the council and city attorney and I to, you know, chat and, you know, catch up and, you know, deal with any issues that need to be dealt with at the time. And then six months later, we'd have uh, another one that will be tied into, you know, would do the mini retreat followed by a full blown um, uh, staff council retreat to look at the annual strategic planning process and just keep it on that cycle. All right. Um, Matt? Yeah, I just had a question actually for Bob. What's the earliest you ever got us out of here? I'm sorry? What's the earliest you ever got us out of council meeting? Uh, I, I think I got us out of here in about a half an hour once. I, I got us out of here. I got us out of here about eight thirty one time, as I recall. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure Cameron didn't set any records. So, okay. No, I, I have, and I have a lot more questions. So we'll keep going for a while. Um, I just wanted to ask. Uh, you know, so in the work plan, there's a whole series of specific line items, some of which have not yet come to the council for approval and discussion. So from both a procedural and legal perspective, if we approve the strategic plan tonight, are we, are we approving these, you know, specific projects? So for instance, there's, you know, St. Francis traffic calming improvements, that's coming to the council at a future council meeting, yet it's reflected here in the strategic plan as an item that's going to be done. So how, how should we think about that? And to the degree that the public reads the work plan and some of these things have not yet been debated, what, what's our sort of right. position so on that? All, all, you're, all you're approving is including it in the plan. So any project that still requires, and many, many of them do, additional public approval process steps for the city council would still need to be gone through and achieved. So, you know, the council could, you know, back away from any of those work plan items, change them up, go in a different direction down the road. Um, and I think our plan is to bring back the strategic plan every other month uh, on an agenda so that we could make adjustments that reflect those real world decisions that the council will be making. All right. Um, Matt, yeah, no. yeah, just a comment on your question. The way I look at this is it's, it's a little bit like the process we go through when we have a presentation on something, we ask questions, and then somebody makes a motion and somebody seconds that motion, it just simply means it's worthy of discussion. And that's how I look at whatever's on this plan, is it's worthy of discussion at some time in the future for consideration. But it doesn't mean we're approving anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Which is a great segue towards, uh, Mr. Mayor, I move to adopt resolution 2016 dash 51. 51, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos adopting the City of San Carlos strategic plan. Second. I have a motion and a second. I, I failed to ask if there was any public comment, so I wanted to see if Mr. Perkins wanted to make any comments. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grisilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. And with that, we are adjourned at 840. You're welcome.